section today. So thank you all for joining us uh, today for this vision eval work session. Uh, this is a strategic planning model that AMATS is developing. So we'll kind of go into a little more detail on it, uh, the actual model itself uh, and or the handout we sent out to you all or the presentation you had at the TAC meeting kind of talked about what is vision eval. So don't worry, you don't have to listen to me talk all two hours. I get to sit down and participate as well. So I'm very excited for that. Um, Juan and Jeff, are you guys ready to go? Yes, sorry, okay. I was on mute. <laughs> go ahead, take it away. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I have met several of you virtually, but not everyone. My name is Jeff Furkanja. I'm with RSG. We are a sub to RM for helping all of you update your MTP for its next version. We um, had sent out some preliminary materials and had been to the TAC in August. We were going to come to the PC, but you had a very weighty topic that pushed us off that agenda, and then uh, we sent some written material that hopefully was helpful. We have that and other stuff available today. Uh, my colleague Gabby Freeman is with me. She is the expert on the strategic model that we are deploying to help you think through the alternatives development process for your plan update. And I have a presentation that I will show you. First of all, a sound check. Am I coming through clearly? Yes. Excellent. So we have a, a presentation here that will guide uh, today's work, but uh, I was chuckling at Aaron's joke about listening to him. We hope to listen to all of you to a great extent. I will uh, use the slides really to frame discussion and convey information and the agenda for our work session today, and thanks everyone for participating, is to do some introductions. We've introduced ourselves. I believe that you folks know each other. We're going to spend a little bit of time recapping why we're here so that everyone's clear on what we're doing for you as the consultant team and what we hope that you will do for your update and for us today. That will include then going through what we're calling a preliminary alternatives analysis, and we'll explain more about what that means. But the purpose here, as I mentioned a moment ago, is really to set you folks up for success in adopting the best MTP that you can when that time comes. So we are at a point now where we have looked at some preliminary scenarios, we're calling them. We're going to show those to you. We're going to show you how they perform relative to your planning goals. Talk over those findings, pause at intervals so you can ask questions and make sure that you're following. And then as indicated, really spend as much time as we can getting your feedback on these things. And uh, there will be opportunity to give written feedback later. I know that not everyone um, you know, is comfortable speaking up in the moment, so we can provide for that. And lastly, of course, we'll talk about next steps so you know what to expect. This is your first pass through, again, what we're calling the preliminary alternatives analysis. Um, I, I keep calling them scenarios to make sure that everyone knows that we're not quite at the point of having plan alternatives. Uh, and then you're going to get another visit from us in the November meeting cycle where we're going to come first to the TAC and then to the policy committee. And that's going to be your opportunity to see results from anything you ask us to do further as a result of today's discussion. So, we will, as I said, pause at intervals. If, uh, Aaron, if you could please, uh, are, are there people in the room there then that aren't, so everyone's not on, on Teams? Uh, yes, there are people in the room. All right, if you would please be the MC and uh, call out if there are any questions or requests for pauses. Uh, the last time I was presenting to the TAC, I realized that I couldn't quite hear everyone in the room through the mic. So if you would please facilitate, I'd really appreciate that. Will do. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> slides coming through okay? Yes. All right, so let's talk about why we're here. This is in part a recap of material that we had sent out before, and in part 
an exposition of some of the ingredients and things that we have done as a consultant team to help you grapple with what different plan alternatives you might want to consider for further analysis. As we indicated in our visit to you in the August timeframe and in the written materials, we're deploying a strategic model that Aaron referenced. It's got a long name. It's the Vision Eval Regional Strategic Planning Model. So if you hear us refer to Vision Eval or VE or VERSPM, it is a modeling tool. It's different from your regional travel model, which will also be used for the more detailed analysis later. It lets us run through a lot of things much more quickly uh, in somewhat less detail, but uh, lets us test a lot of different things to help you get down to a few draft alternatives, which is a process step that's going to be coming down uh, the calendar here in a few months. So what we did after visiting you in August was to apply the model by consulting with your staff, the, the MTP staff group, about what types of ingredients or action items, which could be any one of a number of transportation system investments in, let's say, more transit service or, you know, increased programmatic investment in demand management or uh, transit service or, you know, policies that set pricing or tolling or other, other fees or user fees or types of things. And so we created those action items, as I sometimes call them. And we then looked at your planning goals and the types of output metrics or performance measures that the model produces and selected a set of measures that we think serve as indicators to how well a given scenario might be performing relative to your planning goals. And you've got several and we'll review those again in a moment. I'm sure you're quite familiar with them. And then we use the model, and this is one of its advantages, to run through literally hundreds of potential combinations of all those action items. And that is what lets us search for scenarios that might be getting close to serving your planning goals. After the model did its work, we then as, as users of the model, applied those performance measures that we alluded to, and we filtered those hundreds of scenarios down to groups. The group might include four, it might include 12, it might include 16 scenarios. And we've attempted to do that filtering, again, aligned with the planning goals that you have. And so this slide articulates the groupings, uh, and your goals are in parentheses. You have a goal to uh, have a healthy environment. So the indicator is uh, greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants. We have a goal to uh, make, be sure that there's mobility for all your residents and travelers and services and goods movements. And so there are measures that deal with, with how, how mobile the system would be if these actions were implemented. We've got a look at uh, mobility in two flavors, sort of uh, mobility, trying explicitly to look at mobility across all modes, which is partly driven by your equity goal. And we have uh, a mobility look that's a little more focused on vehicular mobility because it was made quite clear to us that you folks are naturally concerned about freight mobility as a part of helping your economy. So those two goals are serving uh, a sort of overlap, sort of mobility and economy in, in the way this model treats the world. <clears throat> Uh, and then we, you know, you have an equity goal, which is, um, which is great. And we wanted to look at what equity outcomes might be occurring, depending on the mix of ingredients or actions that you might deploy in these scenarios. And so the, there's a metric there that looks at what the vehicle utilization costs are for the lowest income residents in your region. And that's an indicator that says, you know, if their costs are, are higher or lower, that might give you a sense of the scenario's equity impacts. Now, there are other measures that we can look at. And in fact, we even have the, 
the results of your live. If we want to, we can get into it and, and try to search for more things if we have time today. Uh, we also wanted to note that you have a safety goal, and the way this model works is that it uh, it can estimate safety outcomes, but it doesn't really involve those with the other actions you might be taking. So <clears throat> the analysis to date assumes that you will be making safety investments of a substantial kind, uh, or at least some kind. <clears throat> That's an assumption that you may ask us to analyze further later, so uh, keep that in mind, please. And so this is part of our process. We've we've done this filtering. We have some scenarios that we're going to show you as as groups in a minute, and then uh, those findings will be useful for you telling us what further analysis we might do if we need to test different types of ingredients or if there are different performance measures that might be helpful to you. So having said that, uh, <clears throat> you know there are. Just some things we'd like you to think about and have in mind in terms of the types of discussion and feedback that we hope to get and that you, uh, by we, I mean both your staff at the agency as well as the consultant team. The, um, as I said, we're going to go through both what the scenarios produced in the way of outcomes using those performance measures, and we're going to show you what made up the scenarios so you understand what mixes of investments and policies might be going down the road to success by your definition of success. So in, in terms of having the discussion to give us guidance as a team to help you further in terms of, you know, do you want more analysis or are some of these going the right direction already? Uh, you could be thinking about, you know, questions like, are the measures that we're using helpful to the decision that you will eventually have to make, which is to design different alternatives for the staff and the consultants to test in more detail? Uh, are the types of action steps that we've tested uh, consistent with the likely actions that you're thinking about? Or is there something else we should try to consider? And then, of course, if 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 some of the scenarios are gelling and we even have a few, you know, uh, hypothetical plan alternative uh, co constructs that we can talk about if, if that interests you, uh, you know, are, is this going the right direction? Do these do these mixes of scenarios that we are judging as your analysts are getting towards your goals, are they going the right direction or are we missing something? Um, and, or is something particularly helpful? It's like, oh yeah, that's going that's going a very good direction. That that mix of investments might then be a candidate to be turned into a full draft alternative later. And so uh, <clears throat> you know good luck comes in threes. I just want to point out that it's typical for agencies to have about three draft alternatives. Certainly, sometimes people have more, but part of the goal here is to help you narrow your thinking down so that you can give to your staff and the consultant team uh, a finite list of draft alternatives for further analysis with your travel demand model and other tools. That analysis will be coming to you later, uh, early 2023, I believe. And as I said earlier, we naturally want to hear from you today, questions, comments, you know, if you need more explanation, if you have direct feedback in terms of guidance for further analysis or what seems to be going the right direction that might be a candidate to be a draft alternative, love to hear that. But as I said before, if you want to think about it a little bit, that's understandable. So we uh, had worked with Aaron to suggest that if you could email comments and questions later, if we could receive those by October 7th, that will help us stay on schedule. And if you could please email anything that follows today's face to face time to Aaron, uh, he will collate and get to the, the team. So with that said, um, that's the, the process overview. Let me pause there and make sure that we're all on the same page. Is it clear what we're trying to do and and you and uh, what we're asking you to do then in terms of feedback and discussion? Or do you have questions? No questions here. Okay, thanks everyone. And forgive me in advance, please. I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm going to try not to cough in your ears, but I might might have to have a sip of tea here just to get through it all. All right, so uh, now we're going to go through the part where we explain a little bit more detail about what we actually did to do this analysis. And once again, I'm going to go through some material. We're going to start to dive into a little more detail 
I'll, I'll pause for questions before we get to the really fun part in which Gabby is going to walk you through the specific scenario groupings and um, and and convey the really um, you know pointy information that's the main subject of today. But we want you to understand the context, how we did some of what we did, what the ingredients are, and so you can um, help us you know facilitate the discussion when that time comes. Just some basic context and background. The strategic model uses the same geography and input assumptions that your travel demand model will be using when we apply the travel demand model to the plan update and the alternatives analysis that, as I said, is going to come later in the calendar. So the uh, there's a tiny little sketch of the model geography at the lower right. Those are a little bit abstract. Those are the traffic analysis zones, as we call them, overlaid on your region. It doesn't show the Kinnick arm because of the way the zones are, but the Overall geography encompasses the vast majority of the municipality of Anchorage, except for the furthest southeast corner, and it encompasses about 94% of the Matsu borough's uh, population and employment, and it, it doesn't cover the physical extent of Matsu to the far north and, and, and west. But in terms of then the people and residents representation in both models. It's the same population and employment input for both models. Each of them will have a 2019 base year and a 2050 horizon year. And you can see the population and employment statistics on the slide. I think the main context point we would point out here is that based on the Alaska Department of Labor forecasts that we and another part of the team allocated to the zone level, we're looking at roughly an 18% population and employment growth over the planning horizon. So, I have a question here, about that. Sure. Uh, do you know what Anchorage specific numbers are? Oh, uh, we do. Do uh, you want to pause and look into those? Uh, I have them on a different, uh, a different document. Can, uh, we can do that at a different time. We can get with Brad to talk about that at a different time. We really need to focus on Vision Zero today, not the populations. OK. Yeah, happy to supply that breakout later. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about the model that we're using. As we remarked during the August discussions, the it, part of the reason it's strategic is that it doesn't have the full network detail that the travel model does, so it doesn't have every freeway and every intersection and every arterial, but it does treat every household and it does have the knowledge of household characteristics like different incomes. And it does do aggregate treatments of transportation supply like transit service, roadway lane miles, the presence of system management techniques like signal timing and other intelligent transportation systems or ITS deployments. So as I mentioned, it uses the same socioeconomic inputs that we'll be using in your travel forecast model. This strategic model is sensitive to a, a range of action options. So it's uh, it can even do land use scenarios as well, which we did not do in this case. Uh, you'll see more about the ingredients we did use in a moment. But then it, it takes these things and it runs under the guidance of an expert like Gabby to essentially test all possible combinations of all those things, which is why there are hundreds of scenarios that come out of it in this case. It has a variety of performance measures. You'll see a selection of those in a moment. And those are things like the amount of VMT generated or the amount of transit trips that were taken or the amount of pollutant emissions that were created by a given 2050 implementation of these various action steps. And the way it's set up is that the, the operator selects eight of those metrics, and then we have this interactive filtering system that we can use to try to dial those metrics in to produce a set of scenarios that seems to be heading the right direction, with right being defined, of course, by your planning goals and your criteria. And then, you know, those scenarios are all output. And we what we've done is basically 
select them and prepackage them for you in some slides today, and we'll call out the common theme of those, by which I mean what they're doing as outcomes and what action steps seem to lead to certain outcomes or at least to the desired outcomes. And that's part of the exercise that Gabby's going to walk us through here. So, uh, questions on the model before I talk about some of the action steps or ingredients? No questions here. All right, moving on then. So this is a table that starts to map the action steps, or it doesn't start, it does map the action steps into your goal areas. And of course, you folks are all professionals in the field, so you understand that a given action may produce outcomes that span multiple goals. So this should not be interpreted as a fixed one-to-one -one relationship, but it's just for discussion purposes and organizational purposes, it's handy to map these out and to have some uh, correlation here. So the way this table works is that each color code is one of your MTP goals, and then the action steps are just grouped by goals, again, for convenience of discussion. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is actually go through them one by one so it's clear what we tested so you understand the findings that will be coming out in a moment. And the in terms of mobility options, I, I referenced earlier that we envision from the preliminary work that you're concerned about mobility across multiple modes and users. So we have a variety of action steps that, you know, in some cases uh, treat mobility, in some cases also treat accessibility. So there is an action that would increase uh, or make investments to increase walk and bike and sort of non-auto trips by about 20%. There are actions that would increase investments in travel demand management programs and their effects by about 10%. There's a large investment of transit, increased transit service about a, a, by half. And then there is a transit configuration tactic that would put more service into the neighborhood level to reflect a sort of last mile type of service as opposed to trunk line types of service. So those are some of the action items that would you know could be classified as mobility some of them help other goals as you'll see as we start to pull out the findings i mentioned the safety goal that you have and the fact that the model can account for that so there are some potential things we could test those aren't being shown today because as i said the model doesn't really interact the safety outcomes with the other outcomes so it wasn't changing anything that we were seeing but we could certainly um, you know, run those scenarios and bring them forward for you if you if you want us to when we visit you later in November. Uh, the you obviously uh, have a maintenance goal uh, that is articulated very clearly, and the model again doesn't really react to like a scenario that has. I mean, it, we we could actually conceivably design a scenario that would show you what would happen if you didn't maintain your facilities and performance started degrading. But in discussion with the agency staff, we thought that it would be useful to test different pricing scenarios because those revenue streams would give you the resources with which to invest in maintenance activities. And also uh, there has been some policy discussion around the region we understand. And so there was a general interest in seeing what types of results might come out from the pricing options. There were two specific actions, a state fuel tax increase at 10 cents and a VMT charge at 3 cents per mile. Obviously, uh, you folks would depend on other legislatures to enact things like this, although some regions have in the United States have conceived of their own VMT type of charge. Uh, we acknowledge that, and there are certainly examples in other regions where plans have you know assumed certain revenue instruments as a means of providing funding for example based on past performance of state legislatures i did a lot of work in washington state and the the federal highway folks were amenable to saying that you know a plan could assume you would have a fuel tax increase over the next 15 or 20 or 30 years so uh, we realize that you don't have those policies directly in your control but 
they are legitimate things that can be considered in the planning process in our experience. And again, there was interest in seeing how they could be helpful to some of your goals. So they're included here as a part of the mix. Uh, you know, there are many things, frankly, that would support your strong economy goal. Uh, maintaining your existing infrastructure is a part of it, as you articulated yourselves. Many of the other tactics would also help by increasing personal mobility, increasing freight mobility, optimizing system performance so there's more throughput even without major capital investments and so forth. So the two tactics that we uh, put in that bin for just for organizational purposes are to increase your system management deployments by 10%. We realize that you have done very well on coordinating your signals both inside the uh, core urban areas of the region, but also on some of the uh, other facilities. But we also understand that there's more to be done. And so there's an option there. Uh, you know, you, you may be contemplating capital investments and increased road facilities. So that's an option here where the total lane miles could, uh, we, we tested it at a total increase of 10%. Uh, in terms of healthy environment, I mentioned on a previous slide that the proxy performance measure for that is air pollutant and greenhouse gas emissions. There are many other elements of the environment we realize, but that's a useful proxy since <clears throat> you obviously have responsibilities under the Clean Air Act and the, the greenhouse gas emissions is getting a lot of attention in many regions. <clears throat> the tactics that uh, sort of map directly into that are a variety of electric vehicle measures. And I want to be careful to explain these because we're not talking about private electric vehicle use here. We're talking about things that you could conceivably as a group of public agencies have some leverage on. For example, the first one is to increase EV charging at multifamily and group quarter housing locations. For example, uh, the university or other major institutions where there is an actor that you could cooperate with to promote that. Uh, increase the proportion of commercial service vehicles for EVs uh, and, and increase really public fleet service vehicles where you do have some control. So the, the last three in that list are really talking about, you know, transit agencies can make choices about their vehicles uh, and then, you know, the service vehicles and things that you folks control in the public fleet are really what this set of tactics is about. There are other tactics that affect emissions, of course. Uh, you'll see some of those results in a minute. For your equity goal, we actually have some performance measures that speak to equity, and you'll uh, see that in the form of the cost of auto travel to the lowest income residents in your region. That's the performance metric. We, we had some discussion with your staff about you know, the potential future of your economy, and there was some interest in testing a scenario where real income per person or per capita grew by 10%. That would be a situation where, you know, people were becoming more wealthy and, and getting better jobs over the planning horizon. Or the downside scenario of the reverse, where there's a 10% decrease in per capita income on average. Uh, those are not necessarily equity, so it's a little unfair to tie them directly to equity, but they speak to the fact that your economic goals are to have prosperity for everyone. And they're part of the mix that does actually have some bearing. Uh, not uh, We're going to focus more on the other ingredients, so to speak, as we go through it, because they seem to have more weight. There's a couple of places where different economic scenarios did have a noticeable effect, and we'll call those out as we go through. So with that said, again, this is a lot of information packed into one table. Uh, so these are the different action steps that were tested to produce the hundreds of actual scenarios. Let me stop there and see if there are any questions about these before we proceed. There are a lot of questions. Just real quick before anyone in the room gets to it, I want to make sure Yemi uh, from DTC's question is addressed. He's asking, if the model does not have a transportation network, how does it efficiently account for the local VMT and GHG emissions from the various road networks? Sure, I'll take a stab at that and then Gabby may want to add. So the model uh, does an aggregate treatment of transportation system supply 
and it has regression models or submodels in it that were calibrated to things like household travel survey data from the National Household Travel Survey and example uh, observed performance from a variety of areas around the United States. And so those statistical models basically estimate VMT directly from a series of explanatory variables that were found to be statistically significant. Is that enough detail or would you like Gabby to get into more detail? Uh, it's up to Yemi if he needs more information or not. Yeah, I, I would appreciate if Gabby could, you know, dig more into the, uh, you know, the needed greedy of all the regression analysis and now uh, the survey. Yeah. Would it be okay if we did that offline? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, okay. that, that would be fine. Yeah. I, I would, uh, That that's a, a deep topic. So uh, if you would, we can put you together with Gabby and other experts who worked on the estimation if you uh, want to really, really dig in. Yeah. I would appreciate that. Thank you. You bet. Okay, thank you. So I know we have a number of individuals. Daniel, you were first. Thanks. This is Daniel. I'm in Long Range Planning. When I look at the Promote a Healthy Environment and I compare that with the goals of the MTP, um, all I see here is five things about EVs. But I, I'm just wondering, is there a way, is, is it possible to add more actions that aren't specifically related to EVs? Because looking at the goals, it's air quality, resiliency, <coughs> reliance, um, promote healthy lifestyles, increase active transportation. The only actions I see here are related to vehicles and electric vehicles, where when I think of promote a healthy environment, at least when I look at the goal in the MPP, there's a lot more to it. And I, I feel like this is maybe missing um, what is actually envisioned in, in the goals. Is okay. there, are there other actions you could add, stuff about maybe reducing certain types of travel supply or other things that reduce the reliance on any type of vehicle or that sort of thing. Thanks. Uh, the short answer is yes. And some of the other uh, tactics do overlap into maintaining a healthy environment. Uh, you'll see, for example, that some of the pricing work has outcomes that are environmentally friendly. Uh, and, and, you know, there are mode shift effects that we'll talk about where there are some positive environmental benefits. Uh, but in terms of detail, Gabby, uh, any thoughts on sort of non uh, emissions related environmental aspects that we could test if we, if desired? Yeah, if we're concerned about um, more active transportation, um, Alternative modes, I think those are covered by the first goal area there, improved mobility options. We're testing an increase in bike infrastructure investment, as well as an increase in uh, transit revenue miles and service. Um, in terms of public health, uh, that's unfortunately not really something that we, there, there's a metric for currently in the model that we can analyze. Um, but our hope is that these alternative modes, walking, biking, um, are a good proxy for that. Um, yeah, and we want to be clear that the model doesn't analyze everything. It, it doesn't have like, although there are some new developments in motion that a pooled fund project is funding under FHWA's direction that are looking at a public health module, I don't think we have any like, wastewater or surface water or noise elements yet, correct? Gabby, those are still in the future research and development list, correct? Yeah, public health is something that is is being <laughs> developed into this model um, in terms of, you know, noise, um, water, those kinds of things. I'm not sure that there is uh, much much investment in getting those aspects into the model, but public health has definitely been identified as something that they're looking to integrate into the vision eval models. So uh, in, in, in summary, there are things we <laughs> would like the model to do that it does not now treat. Uh, some of those are in the R&D list, but some of those aren't. So, but there are effects that we'll try to call out as we go through the findings that may be pertinent to this goal. 
other other questions? Yeah, we have a lot of them. Brad, you were the next one. I'm just going in order of people I've seen. So Brad, you're next. I was curious about some of these and how they translate into the, the model, like increasing per, per capita income. Does that assume that if there's higher incomes that more people will drive cars? Or like, how does it translate into like traffic effects? Sure, uh, great question. Uh, Gabby, why don't you take that one? Because I know you and I have talked a lot about the sort of the the causal relationships in the model and the income effects. So go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I think we're going to get into some of these topics. That, that's the, the next piece here is we're going to go get into the causation mm -hmm. of all of these different uh, policy areas and how they impact different performance metrics. Um, but just to speak on about income briefly, the way that the model treats income is it uses a household's income to to define their transportation budget that is then going to be one of the factors that helps estimate their overall um, travel demand. So um, just speaking very generally here, Households that have a much higher income, they're going to have a higher transportation budget. And if they have other factors like a larger household size, for instance, mm -hmm. they may have um, that may have a high higher household travel demand um, than if they were to have a, a lower mm -hmm. income, which would there then therefore like cap their uh, overall household uh, travel budget. And let me add to that that the other factors that Gabby referenced then in estimating household uh, travel demand play out in terms of the fact that, as we have on the screen here, you might have a travel demand management program. So uh, uh, an in, uh, a household that has a high budget and a high number of household members may be generating a lot of travel, but the types of modes they choose in the model structure depend on these other factors. So if you make more transit available, for example, and you make uh, an investment in a demand management program, you might see those trips coming out more in terms of transit than in terms of auto. So the, the model is accounting for all effects taken together to the greatest extent possible. This, this speaks to a certain extent to Yami's question earlier about the actual statistical structure. So yeah, that answers my first question. I've got another one as well. Okay. Uh, does it does the modeling assume, or how could we assume like Matsu acting as its current uh, relationship with Anchorage, where there's a lot of commuting, versus what I have heard in talking with some of the Matsu uh, planners that they've seen a shift of Balmer Wasilla kind of containing a lot more of their residents, so less commuting. Is that something that is factored in um, to the model somehow? Uh, well, I'll take a stab at that. I would say that the um, there are land use scenarios that could be tested. We did not test those in this instance. We would, uh, we would, uh, you know, again. But basically, by looking at land use inputs, capture that in the travel demand model analysis. Uh, particularly if you, you know, uh, supposed a a future where there were additional amenities within Matsu itself, rather than having folks drive to Anchorage. But we didn't test different land use configurations in this mix in this strategic modeling exercise. Okay, and the last question that I have is just VMT reduction. Is that something that applies here or how, how does that kind of relate? Well, VMT is an outcome. So it, the model estimates, as, as Gabby was uh, explaining a moment ago, the model takes a great number of factors, you know, the, the household incomes, the household travel budget, household size, uh, you know the 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 land use that is encoded uh, in the model and creates travel demand, 
and then policies and investments that are tested in a given scenario affect how that demand plays out in terms of mode choice and trip length and things like that. So VMT is an output and you'll see a performance measure that is daily VMT per capita, but that's a that's an outcome, not an input. The inputs are, you know, do you have a travel demand program that you're increasing by 10% or are you investing in a lot more transit service or or things that are listed on the right side of this table? Does that, okay. does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I'm good. Okay, uh, Daniel, you're next. Thank you. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at the support the economy, maintain, maintain existing infrastructure category. And um, I guess I don't know if this is really a comment or a question. You gave the caveat that some of these things, you know, are not one to one and then other things can impact, you know, other pieces. But in terms of that goal and that action, are we just talking about supporting movement of freight when we're talking about supporting the economy? Because I think, you know, having good mobility options, that's something that is beneficial to the economy. So I don't know if we need like more specific language or I don't know. I just I feel like that goal and that action just kind of leaves me feeling like that's a partial thing. Uh, it's already sure. Goals to be sure, it's a fair observation. I, I guess I could elaborate a little more on what I said before. The uh, uh, many of the actions that are on the list would have an effect on the economy. Uh, any increase in accessibility or mobility uh, would arguably have a, a, an outcome, and so we don't we don't by any stretch mean that there's you know there's a limit here. Uh, so I uh, we we have some measures that the, the actual measure that is kind of an economic measure is a, a revenue measure that you'll be seeing in a minute. Uh, Gabby, are there other measures that the model has that speak more to economic outcomes? Um, other than household income and um, maybe some of the heavy heavy duty vehicle VMT, there's not really many others I can think of. Um, this model is really focused on household travel behavior, and so it's not very detailed when it comes to commercial service or um, freight movement. Um, it, those factors are, they're in the model, they're accounted for, but they have nowhere near the same level of uh, granularity that household travel does. Um, so they're not really ideal to look at in our in our suite of performance metrics just because there's not a lot of model sensitivity to them. Thank you. I, I guess just when we're looking at the ingredients or baking the cake, um, just from a policy point of view, I, I, if we're looking at different levers going up and down, I, I wouldn't want to feel like I'm um, taking away from supporting the economy if I'm moving the lever up for improving mobility options. And I, I, I think you'll see in the findings that we agree with you that uh, gen generally increased mobility would lead to high, you know, better economic outcomes, other things being equal. Thanks. So I, I appreciate your comment. I, I, a lot of this is getting into, uh, I, I'm starting to perceive a pattern here where people want more. We, we have discussion at the end to, to capture all the more stuff. So, uh, but I'm happy to keep answering questions. Now, this was really... Uh, and, and also, of course, uh, to be transparent about the model's limitations, what it can do and can't do. So that's a part of today's purpose, I should have mentioned, is to be clear, which is why this table is here. So uh, let's keep going, though, because we want to get to the, the findings. Uh, other questions at the uh, moment? Yes. Uh, Jamie has one question. Or okay, with a short of the microphone is hi, Jamie Action, Public Transportation Department Director. Um, I, this might just be a question that is um, of no relevance relevance to the model, but um, as we look towards our alternative 
schools program, we have not identified EVs at this point as being our preference. Um, would there be room to perhaps just reference alternative fuels rather than EVs? In the uh, transit fleet or? Yeah, um, as it relates to transit fleet. Yes, there are other fuels um, available. We, you know, that's we we selected EV as our first go here, but um, there's other options: CNG, um, nat natural gas, um, even biofuel is available. I can get you the full list. I have to look it up, but um, there's so a wide array. So, so what I'm hearing is we might need to commit to one prior to actually having a plan in place. Well, I we, would say that we could test different options for you within the scope that we have between now and November. So this is one of those things that, like, as I said, at the end, we're going to ask you, should we try something different? So maybe this is something that we should put on the list and we could, you know, uh, test different a different mix of those things if the group so chooses or so advises, like more than one, depending on all the other uh, additional things that people might want to test. Great. I just didn't want to set an expectation that transit was going to, you know, a, a effectively transition to 50% EVs when we may go with CNG at some point or we may go with an alternative, you know, another alternative. So, um, right. So that was my thought there. I, th I think this highlights something that Gabby and I wanted to remark at some point. So this is a good point. You know, the we're at this point, we're trying to get like the big effects on the page. So you could think of EV penetration in the transit fleet as a proxy for a number of different actions that basically reduce transit vehicle emissions. And then as you as you give us advice at the end of today's work session about what we should further analyze, you know, be thinking, uh, I, I always advise folks in alternatives analysis to be thinking about stuff that that where the difference matters. So if it matters to you to test, you know, uh, EVs versus, you know, biodiesel or compressed natural gas, then that would be something to bring forward. If you just need to know that, you know, a certain investment that gets transit emissions down a certain amount is something you want in your plan, it may be that the proxy is enough. I'm not telling you if it's enough. I'm just suggesting to you, you think along those lines, what are the major differences we want to understand as we advance the planning process to the alternatives analysis phase? Because you're going to get, as I said, you're going to be able to test, you know, three draft alternatives, ideally maybe four. Uh, Aaron and, and, and Juan will speak to sort of the the limit there, but, you know, we're going to have to get it for further analysis. We're going to have to get it down to a smaller set of scenarios and so I advise people to be strategic about picking the things they want to analyze. But we're certain we could we could do it. Yes. Wait, one more question, Luke. Uh, looking at uh, the maintain existing infrastructure, we've only got two action items there. The first one increase the fuel tax, which is under the control of the legislature. I don't know what would go into the VMT mileage based fee, but I guess my concern there is if maintaining what we have needs to be a priority. And right now I'm just seeing two action items that have us searching for additional funding. Uh, can you give a little bit more reasoning why those are the only two action items there? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, the model as structured, this speaks to the question earlier about, you know, what are the, the math uh, items going on in the model? The model itself doesn't uh, have an input that says we are we are on an optimal maintenance cycle or we are not on an optimal maintenance cycle. We could devise a scenario that represents being off optimal maintenance cycles and show you what that would look like. But given the fact that sort of maintenance isn't an input per se, we thought in discussion with staff that having revenue with which to fund maintenance would be a useful thing to test but again if you have other ideas about i mean for example uh the next slide i think it is says uh something about safety investments we um we have assumed on safety that you're going to be making a safety investment of some kind 
we could analyze how much you put in and, and what it kind of produces in terms of reduced crash rates, but it doesn't interact with other uh, other aspects of the model. So it, it doesn't really give you any satisfaction in, in the scenarios. But if there's some maintenance scenario that you have in mind, uh, we could test that. And, and frankly, maintenance is, uh, you know, well, I've already said that having enough money to fund maintenance is important, so that's why it's in there. But there, if there's something else you have in mind that would be a, a test that would help you, we could talk about it. I guess I'm thinking about the the projects that are in between a safety improvement and frack seal, right? We've got rutting problems that we're going to have around town, and that's going to require more than a, a maintenance crew would be capable of doing. So I, that that level of, of project uh, should, should be a consideration, in my opinion. Sure. I, I take your point. I, I guess I'm saying that these these models, I mean, even your travel model, are designed to estimate system performance, and maintenance doesn't get incorporated explicitly. It can be tested if you don't maintain things, like the like uh, King County, Washington has a bridge that is closed because they didn't have money to rebuild it. So you can test a scenario and say, okay, if we don't fund maintenance, what happens on the downside? But um, and and you can you your plan certainly could have elements in it that aren't addressed by this analysis. But I don't know. We could think more about what a maintenance scenario would look like. But I don't, I'm not quite sure what it would look like. So that would take further thought. Okay. Um, let's do last one, Matt. We need to move on. Okay. Uh, I just want to know if if the model would be able to <clears throat> inform us as to areas where we should prioritize traffic signalization to get the biggest return? Uh, no, that would require more detailed analysis with a different tool. Okay. This model does, as we mentioned, an aggregate treatment of the system. It doesn't do a, 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 a micro simulated or a, a really a detailed representation of the network at all. System as a whole. Yeah. Okay. I think let's move on and see. Uh, that may help to answer some of the questions that sure. people made. So, so uh, I'm going to take uh, probably a few minutes here. Just uh, I see that this group really wants to dig in. So we have a couple slides here that are about uh, how to read the graphs. Again, the, the slides, we, we have verbally summarized all of the key findings for you today because, uh, and, and we can make these available, these slides, I mean, but I wanted, there are graphs on the slides and <clears throat> I wanted to give you just a quick how to read them in case people wanna read the details. But if you don't wanna look at the details, don't worry, Gabby's gonna explain in words and in bullet points what the outcomes are. But uh, <clears throat> there are two, in, in this particular model, there are two primary charts that come out. There are charts that show the performance measures, and there are charts that show sort of the ingredients grouped by those themes that we showed a few minutes ago. And for the performance measure charts, they are a kind of special to the model. <clears throat> the title tells you the performance measure, and in response to a previous question, we remarked that VMT is an outcome. The model estimates what VMT would be. And in this case, we've chosen daily VMT per person or per capita as the as the measure. So the title tells you what the measure is. The subtitle tells you the average across all the selected scenarios. And remember, we're selecting scenarios, so this isn't all scenarios. It's selected scenarios. And then the horizontal axis is the actual value binned into different bins appropriate to whatever the scale of that measure is. And then the, and here's where it's different from a lot of the bar charts you normally see. The vertical axis is the number of scenarios that produced that performance measure value. So in this case, you can see that, is, is my cursor visible or not? It is. So you can see that uh, the scenario, there were over, I think that's, I think I cut off the 50, forgive me, but there are 50 scenarios out of some several hundred where the VMT per capita was 12. And so the way to read this is that the more scenarios that produce that finding, 
uh, that has more weight in the in the mix. And then the corollary is the um, there are uh, bar charts at the top to talk about what those action steps were. And they're a little abstract and we can decode them for you. I have a cheat sheet handy. But again, we're, we want to focus on the big outcomes today. So we're hoping not to dr drill into every detail, but if time permits, we can. In this case, the mobility options were a group of investments that sort of fit your mobility goal, realizing that there's lots of overlap and fuzziness. So the title tells you what group we put the investments in. The x-axis is a code, a number index into the actual action that you saw explained in text in the previous colorful table. And then again, the y-axis or vertical axis is the number of scenarios that contained that action step that produced the findings that you're going to see in a minute. So we can get into, I propose to get into it now and have Gabby do the fun stuff because we do want more feedback from you. So I will move on. So remember, you know, we have curated these findings. So there are I forget, uh, 400, 300 some, Gabby, <laughs> scenarios that the model ran. Uh, so we have been selective, trying to, you know, reach scenario groupings that meet your goals. Uh, there are more scenarios that could be looked at. And again, if you want us to have different performance measures or different mixes of ingredients, that's doable. So Gabby, take it away, please. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And um... Just one small point of clarification as we start interpreting some of these findings together. When we're looking at the scenario input level charts up top, um, that L1, which stands for level one, is always going to refer to our baseline forecast, which um, aligns with the, the travel demand model. So the policies that we're testing, the increase in transit, the increase in bike infrastructure, that's always going to correspond to the higher numbered bars, the L2 and L3 bars. Um, so L1 is kind of your no build, your future no build. Exactly. Yep. All right. So digging into these findings, uh, we're going to start looking at some of the scenarios with the lowest air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'll walk through these, but I'll pause after each group of scenarios to, to answer any questions if there, if there are any. So in this slide, uh, you can see in the kind of lower left hand corner of the visual, there's a red box where I'm trying to highlight our air pollution uh, emissions performance metric. Uh, so if you kind of squint at the screen, maybe, I'm sorry, it's a little small, you can see that we have filtered and we've selected kind of the lowest quarter of the air pollutions. And so we're filtering for those scenarios that that align with that filter. Um, and then the top scenario input levels show us which of the bins those particular scenarios fall in. Uh, so starting with mobility options, these low emission scenarios correspond with investment in walking, biking, and transit. And again, just point of clarification, our L2 is testing biking and um, transportation demand management, and the L3 is testing uh, transit. So both of those pretty equal result on, on getting lower emissions. Um, moving on to the pricing category there, um, you can see that the L3, which that corresponds with the VMT charge at three cents a mile, it has a very strong relationship with this uh, air pollution selection. So uh, VMT charge is discouraging vehicular travel. You can also see that in the DVMT per capita metric just above the air pollution. Um, we're, we're getting lower DVMT in this group of uh, scenarios. Uh, and moving on to the next set there, the healthy, healthy environment, the L2 is showing the most uh, scenarios or really all of the scenarios in this filter. That's our EV adoption. So pretty straightforward that higher, 
higher adoption of EVs and fleet vehicles is going to lead us to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then out of the rest of our uh, scenario buckets here, you can see the infrastructure. Uh, there's a pretty wide spectrum of infrastructure investments um, that that correlate. There's not really one that's rising to the top here. And um, for the income category, it's the L2 that is showing a relationship, and that is the scenario where we increase per capita income. So that's likely related to the fact that higher income and higher household travel budgets mean that they are um, able to afford newer and more fuel efficient vehicles. Vehicle age and vehicle fuel type are all uh, things that are accounted for in this model. So higher income is is linked likely to to newer and more fuel efficient vehicles, which is why we're seeing that result. Um, so any questions on this group of scenario before we move on to the next? And there's, I guess I will caution that, happy to take questions, but there's got several to go through here. Um, and we'll likely see some themes emerge as we go through them. But yeah, anything I can answer here? Doesn't look like any questions. Great. All right, can we go to the next slide, please, Jeff? All right, the next uh, group of filter or the next group of scenarios that we're looking at are those that um, produce high multimodal mobility. So walking, biking, uh, transit. And the <coughs> image we're showing here is um, a selection from the transit trips metric on the right hand, upper right hand side. Um, but we also tested uh, high bike trips. And even though that example is not shown here, uh, we saw very similar results from selecting high bike trips and high transit trips. Um, I also wanted to note that we noticed uh, high uh, correlation or synergy between transit trips and walking trips. And when, when we had scenarios that had high instances of transit trips, we noticed that those scenarios also tended to have a high amount of walking trips and vice versa. So there's a definite, definite synergy happening in the model between those two modes. Um, looking at our scenario policies, uh, no surprise here, it's that L level three mobility option, which is our transit investment that shows a, a correlation with high transit trips. In the pricing scenario, we're again seeing uh, the VMT charge showing up here, um, likely because it's uh, discouraging vehicular travel. Um, we're also seeing uh, the L2 healthy environment, so EV investment. And in terms of our infrastructure scenarios, um, I will note that none of the scenarios in this selection had the increase in uh, road lane miles, but there were some scenarios that had the uh, ITS investments. Any questions here before we move on to the next one? Nope. All right, let's keep rolling. <laughs> Next slide, please, Jeff. Sorry, uh, lost the button here. I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm capturing the notes and questions from the uh, chat, so sorry. Is this the right slide, Gabby? Yep, this is it, yeah. Great. Um, so next group here are the scenarios with high mm -hmm. auto mobility. So again, thinking of this as um, really tying into the support the economy goal, freight movement, um, passenger vehicle movement, et cetera. Um, so for this particular set of scenarios, we filtered using the 
a DBMT per capita metric that's highlighted. Um, and you can see in our in our policy levers here that it corresponded to more of the baseline measures. Um, so a lot of the scenarios were in the, the base, the L1 uh, bucket for mobility options, which means no investment or um, or less investment in alternative modes. So in this case, we had no scenarios in the transit investment bucket, but there were a few scenarios that fell into the, the biking slash TDM investment bucket. Um, for our pricing policies, again, the baseline forecast was uh, had the highest relationship here. Um, more people wanted to travel more when they weren't being taxed as much. They had more budget that they could afford to, to travel more. So um, again, the BMT charge was absent in this filter. Uh, and you saw most in the L1 bucket and uh, some in the L2, which is the 10, 10 cent increase in the fuel tax. Um, across the rest of the policies there, uh, you can see a wide spectrum of the EV policies and infrastructure investments fell into the selection. So no patterns to to really call out there. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And if there are no questions, we can just keep chugging along here to the next set of scenarios. No questions. Great. Um, next set of scenarios, we were looking at equity. Um, so the metric we used here is vehicle cost as a proportion of household income and specifically filtering for low income households or households with uh, less than 2K annual um, household income. So <clears throat> overall, we found that the transit investment had pretty overwhelmingly the, the strongest relationship with the scenarios that had the lower vehicle cost. Um, in the initial filter that we, we did here, we found that pricing was not a big part of the mix. You can see in the pricing category, L1, it's our baseline forecast. Um, but we did a, a bit more investigation here. And if you could proceed to the next slide. We, uh, uh, with some extra filtering and examination, we, we found that lower vehicle costs and pricing policies are not necessarily mutually exclusive, especially when they're combined with other policy levers here, specifically uh, some alternative mode investments like transit or access to EV charging. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, next, we're looking at scenarios that produce the highest revenue, specifically thinking of revenue for roadway maintenance and improvements, particularly winter maintenance. Um, so we have a metric here that, that corresponds to annual tax revenue. And I will just call out that this metric uh, just corresponds to uh, tax revenue collected from household vehicle travel. It doesn't account for commercial, commercial vehicle uh, fuel tax or um, freight fuel tax. It's just the, the household travel bucket. Um, so first, looking at the pricing policies, because that's going to have the, the most influence here, you can see that the, the VMT charge was much more efficient at generating revenue than the increase in the fuel tax. Um, that is likely due to the fact that in all of these scenarios, we're looking at a, a, at a future year, we're looking at the 2050 results. So in that future year, we're, we're going to see more future 
um, vehicle fuels and technologies and higher adoptions of hybrid and electric vehicles in the household fleet that is likely chipping away at the fuel tax and why we're seeing um, that the, the VMT tax is really the only pricing scenario that um, corresponds with these high amounts of, of revenue. Um, we also noticed that uh, scenarios with high revenue also tended to be those that did not make investments in alternative modes. Uh, you can see in mobility options, there's more scenarios in the, the L1 bucket than there are in the L, L2 and L3 buckets. So perhaps we can infer that there's um, more reliance on vehicular travel in those, in those base scenarios, and that is generating more, more revenue through the VMT tax. Um, otherwise, we're not seeing too much across the other scenarios. Again, it's a, a wide spectrum of the EV and infrastructure scenarios. And again, I, the reason we're not seeing too much causation um, in the EV scenario is because our metric is looking at the household vehicle travel, whereas our healthy environment uh, scenarios are looking at EV adoption and um, in fleet vehicles. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. Any questions here? Uh, yes, there is a question, Brad. Yeah, so one question that I have is that second bullet where it talks about less investment in alternative modes and more reliance on autos. And the immediate thought that I had was, doesn't more use of autos mean that there's higher need for roadway maintenance? And so just that question of is additional revenue versus additional maintenance needs kind of it, it seems like maybe the revenue isn't a great stand in for the maintenance kind of like was being addressed earlier especially that element of increased maintenance needs that comes into play yeah that's a that's a really good point here and um we're we're only accounting for revenue collected and not so much the revenue or the the spending needs that are created by more reliance on vehicles and autos. So I think that's a good point to keep in mind. Uh, sorry, folks, but my speaker was garbled there. I heard Gabby's response, but not the question. Would you mind repeating the question? I'm taking some notes here. Yeah, the, the question, I guess, was more of a little bit of a comment about how, in this case, that second bullet that talks about less investment in alternative modes and more reliance on autos, and just the fact that more reliance on autos is associated with the increased maintenance need. And so it seems like revenue is not a great stand-in for maintenance in the fact that some of these results are pointing to kind of that, that question of of need and impact. Um, okay. All right, thank you. I, I just want to sort of strengthen what Gabby was saying. Uh, as with any forecast analysis, we recommend that you use caution when interpreting the results. Remember that the filter was to pick the scenarios that happen to produce the highest revenue. So highest revenue, given the revenue instruments, which are based on vehicle travel, are naturally going to occur in scenarios that have more vehicle travel. So just be careful here. The cause, you know, the cause is running a certain direction. There's more revenue because there's more vehicle travel, right? So that's my interpretation of these findings. So we're not saying that, you know, there may be other ways to raise revenue. OK, so we tested two. Uh, just be, uh, just be cautious about, you know, thinking about the causality here as you as you digest these things, I suggest. Uh, I think my comment is more I'm feeling less comfortable using revenue as a standard for maintenance situation. Gotcha. Yes, we take we the, we've got several notes on that. I think I, I 
Uh, I think you've made that remark before and others reinforced it. So thank you. Uh, back to you, Gabby. Uh, uh, there's another question or comment. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I realized that the in for that goal, we were talking about rev revenue generated from the transit system. But I, when we set that goal, um, it, it was meant to maximize revenue for the economy. I realized a transportation model can't can't tell you how that goal is achieved. So to me, I think that's that's just wasted effort and time to even analyze that goal. We, we have no intent to maximize uh, tax revenue fuel costs. Uh, so I, I would I would nix that goal and and that analysis. It's it's basically not not something we're striving for in, in that limited scope. Okay, thank you. Other observations on this one? Uh, does it look like it? Okay, thank you. Oh, hold on. There's another question from Yemi. Uh, while the model was considering the scenarios, did it account for possible or potential shortage of electric vehicles? Currently, some states, example New Jersey, are struggling with sales of EVs. Also, electrification comes with several issues, including cost of charging and installing charging stations, battery issues, etc. I hope these are taken into account. Um, Gabby, uh, I, I, I think that we don't account in the model for shortages of supply. Uh, but uh, and is that isn't that correct? Yeah, our future year that we're modeling is um, 2050, so we have a pretty far out horizon, so um, we're not accounting for any short term supply issues that uh, we may be observing more today or, you know, in the next couple years. Um, but and, and in terms of the cost of charging, um, the exact input into the model as far as charging goes is the availability of charging by household type. So there's distinctions made between single family housing and multifamily housing and group quarter housing. And you can define the, the proportion of households that have access to EV charging. Um, so that was one of the inputs that we we're um, leveraging here is increasing the availability of charging to multifamily and group quarter um, housing, but it does not account for the infrastructure cost of installing those charging units. In fact, I want to add uh, again for transparency, the model is estimating the effects of policies and investments on system performance. It is not accounting for costs, so it's not doing a benefit cost calculation and it. So, you know, the the costing of the investments would be a separate exercise, which is partly why the percentages are um, not huge in all cases. Uh, you you eventually, as you know, have to adopt a financially constrained plan and so if there are, this is certainly a topic for today's discussion, if there are different levels of investment or policy impact that you would like to have tested, we can certainly do that. But I just want to be clear to you that the model is not accounting for how you're going to fund, you know, the uh, the further ITS deployments that we are testing. The, that's, a, that's a separate financial exercise. <clears throat> Uh, okay. No, so no further questions. I think we're at another another group of scenarios here. Um, yeah, this is the last last group of scenarios here, and uh, this group is really we're trying to balance several different goals. So this is filtering for scenarios that produce high mobility and not 
not discriminating here. These are scenarios that have high auto mobility and, and multimodal non-auto taken together. And we're also selecting for below average um, GHG and air emissions. Um, so again, some of those themes that we've we've seen throughout and then several several of these other scenario filters emerge. And um, the common themes here are that the uh, investment in transit is prevalent here, as is the VMT uh, fee <coughs> and the uh, EV adoption and, and charging scenario. And then there's less distinction within our within our other scenario categories. So um, wide spectrum of infrastructure investments, et cetera. So any any last questions on this group of scenarios or any of the other ones we saw um, before? No questions in the room. <laughs> OK, thanks, folks. Um, I think it's back to me now. Um, thanks very much, Gabby. Uh, we have. Uh, oh, good, we've got more than half an hour left, so this is this is working out well. I just wanted to remind you, we said this several times that. Um, you know, given the, the cause and effect relationships that are currently in the model statistical structure, we, we actually have some um, some safety inputs but we don't have a performance measure for you because we simply have safety inputs <laughs> rather than a different mix of them. Uh, and, and those are basically um, similar. If you're familiar with highway safety manual procedures, they are essentially asserted crash rates based on a certain level of investment. So those, those weren't causing any differences. And so we didn't report on them today, which is basically tantamount to saying that similar to the comment about the needs for maintenance, that you will naturally want to put forward a certain amount of safety investment in your plan alternatives. Um, we, could in, we could show the effects of those different levels of investment in this type of structure if you would like, but it's not really you know, changing the game from this analysis is viewpoint. So we just wanted to be transparent about that. that we recognize that safety is very important, but uh, you know, it's it, it uh, you know we're not going to see a lot of cause and effect outcomes from this particular tool. So with all that said, um, we uh, speculated purely hypothetically, of course, as to what mixes of alternatives might or excuse me, scenarios and their ingredients might form the bases for plan alternatives, but I don't want to talk about that unless folks are interested, particularly since uh, we appreciate all your questions. Uh, obviously, you're very active and engaged, which is superb. We thought we'd pause here and uh, uh, again, see if you want to review any of the things you saw about the groups of scenarios. Uh, proceed to discussion to give us guidance as to what further analysis you might like or different different ingredients to test or different performance measures. There's been some comments in the chat that I'm trying to keep up with. I don't think I'm 100% kept up. Or we could, you know, dive in and talk about what an actual draft alternative might look like based on these findings. It's really up to you folks and, and what you want to tell us. So I'll stop there. And so what's your preference? Do you want to get right into the discussion of what what we might change in the analysis or in, in, in any different set of different ways, or do you want to speculate about draft alternatives? What's what's the group's preference? Bart, go ahead. I have a question this is Bart, uh, with transit, and I'm not sure if it falls with what we just talked about or maybe what we're going to talk about. But when we talk, I was kind of hoping that we would find like a right mix of alternatives, which is maybe what we're leading into that you can't just increase transit and expect people to change their behaviors there's there's a there's a formula there that's mixed with land use and parking strategies and density um, that would also need to happen at the same time so is, is that happening in this next round here or 
Is that hidden in the scenarios somewhere? Well, that's a great question. Um, let me take a kind of a general stab at it, and then Gabby, with her more detailed knowledge of the inner workings of the model, may have some additional insights. I think that the um, I think the short answer to your question is that getting all those details right, and we acknowledge that doing that is is important to success in in transit service terms, is probably a more detailed exercise. Uh, the model is basically saying that you're making an investment in service, and given the statistical estimation that we alluded to earlier, you know we have evidence that a certain amount of service, given other explanatory variables, actually produces the outcomes that you saw. That is, you know, an aggregate estimate. It is not what is going to work specifically in Anchorage and the Matsu boroughs. So uh, I would think that, you know, th this is an indicator that increased investment in transit can produce success in, in my you know professional rec recommendation to you. But then, yes, you're right. You're going to want to get the details ironed out. And to a certain extent, the the analysis of the draft alternatives using the travel model will be able to handle some of that, uh, particularly specific service configurations relative to where people are living and working in your region. Gabby, do you want to add anything in response to that? Yeah, so in this uh, the scenario results that we just showed, we <clears throat> um, the the transit in investments just are reflected in that 50% increase in transit service miles. The model does account for um, land use density. Um, there's a transit uh, input that is at the zonal level that comes from the EPA smart location database that is used by the model to assess uh, you know, transit availability or frequency. Um, so that's <clears throat> one thing that the model accounts for. These and and there are other factors like, you know, density and land use that go into the the model estimations of transit. But I agree that you know, no, every model is imperfect. Um, just because it's accounted for in the model doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's going to be reflected in a, in a real world scenario. Of you know, it's not always if you build it they will come. I. I understand that. So um, I think there are certain nuances that are accounted for in the model, but it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a tool. It's not going to be um, a, a, an absolute reflection of real world conditions. So, uh... Thanks for the question. Uh, back to my question, then, if there are no questions to ask, do uh, folks want to open up the discussion now of making, we have some suggestions noted here about things we could try. Uh, are there other suggestions for future activities, analytically speaking, to prepare uh, the information that you would get in the November meetings? Or, uh, again, do you want to speculate about potential draft alternatives mixes, or do you have further questions? Brad, go ahead. Um, I'm curious how the results compare with other communities. And also if there was anything that where you saw anywhere that you saw Anchorage specific conditions created a result maybe you weren't <laughs> expecting. That's another great question. Um, you know, I um There was one finding, but it's it's a little bit speculative because the cause and effect is complex. In fact, there's some, some cause and effect questions in the chat I see that we may have time to address. So I'll take a stab at it with the understanding that this is speculative. This isn't a statement of it, it actually works this way. Um, during some of the filtering, we saw some hints that uh, 
we, when we were trying to, we, we actually changed performance measures on equity uh, once or twice to try to tease out, you know, outcomes that were clearly more or less equitable. And um, again, this is speculation, but there were some hints that your residents are, uh, you know, maybe a little more auto dependent than, uh, be, be, in other words, the transit wasn't having, I mean, transit, as Gabby made crystal clear, and I think the findings are unequivocal on this, is a tool that you could definitely grab to achieve some, many of the goals that you're after. But there was there were some hints that suggested to me, again, I'm a travel forecaster, right? So there were some hints that were saying that maybe your, your, your land use configuration is a little more uh, auto dependent. So that's kind of a question to you. Does that, if you don't mind me asking it back, does that that was one thing I saw that, again, not certain, but it, there were hints. It's probably fair, probably fair statement. Uh, so that actually speaks to the details that the previous question or observation observed that to make transit work, there are more than just throwing more service miles into the mix. We understand that. And probably to make other modes work, there's, <laughs> yeah, a lot more that is going to be required. I mean, you can even just think about the winter and the maintenance that it takes to make other most more successful. Gabby, yeah, was there anything else that you would observe in answer to that? Sorry, I forgot I was on mute there. Um, yeah, I think one one interesting thing I've observed is um, because this particular model uh, is so so focused on household travel, um, it's sometimes difficult to calibrate when you have an area that see, sees a lot of um, external traffic coming in. Um, so that hasn't been an issue <laughs> as much here, uh, which is we've been we've been grateful for, and I think that's honestly the the best application cases for this model. We had some good success applying uh, this same regional model in the Burlington, Vermont area, and so kind of similar in in that way that it's more of um I think. Isolated is the wrong word, but um, you know, maybe not as as connected. We we've just had more success with those regions than uh, say we've had other model applications in places like Boston and New York, and it's just harder to tease out some of the the effects um, in those places where there's all this external traffic coming in. Um, so that's been in an interesting aspect of this particular project that I think is maybe characteristic of the of the region. Speaking of those seasonal challenges, I, I recall you guys saying that the VMT fee had some impacts on mode choice. Is there a seasonal uh, aspect to the model there where, you know, it's negative 20 in January uh, versus you know, maybe a sunny May or June. Maybe it rains for three months straight at the end of the summer. No? <laughs> Not that we have that happen. But no, it never <laughs> happened. Yeah. Uh, I, we, the model does not account for seasonal variation that I'm aware of. At least I haven't seen it. Right, Gabby? So. No, most of the modeling is, you know, <coughs> it, it's... <coughs> estimating travel behavior and on a daily basis so you know the output is dvmt daily vmt um person miles traveled on a given day so maybe that's something we account for if we're going to annualize some of these metrics you know maybe we we don't use a 365 factor you know we account for uh less seasonal travel during the winter or something like that and, and reflect that if we choose to try to annualize some of these things. Maybe another quick question related to that is you've talked about annual or household survey information that 
it sounds like some of the model is using. Is that like national or do you draw from Anchorage or how, how does that come into play? Gabby, do you want to answer that? You're more familiar with the construction of the current model version. Yeah, so um, a lot of the core models are estimated using the census regions. Uh, so Alaska would fall into the western region in that case, but then there's there's a lot of every every step of the model is essentially another uh, logit mm -hmm. model, or there's there's a lot of different steps that that go into the entire modeling process. But there are some sub models that uh, do use Anchorage specific. Um, MSA information, and so because there's uh, basically default data sets that um, that are that are packaged into the model that have default data on, on every MSA in the country, basically. So we the the model does leverage some of those Anchorage specific data sets, and that's in addition to you know the the inputs that we develop specifically <laughs> for the model region. So if I may, um, I just wanted to do a time check. I've been trying to keep up with notes. We've got about 23 minutes left. We do want to be sure that we get some feedback here that would shape next steps because a reminder, we're coming back to you in the November time frame with if you know more, you know, more information along these lines tweaked by ways that you might want us to tweak it. I have a couple comments on that that I can reflect back in a moment. Uh, and then, you know, you folks and others in the region will be figuring out what the actual draft alternatives are, which include more detail than what we are doing in the strategic modeling. Uh, and so that's where this is all headed, is to help you folks design alternatives in a draft form that then will be further tested with the travel demand model and other tools. And then you'll get that information early next year, and then you'll eventually have the fun uh, task of choosing a preferred alternative for your plan. Uh, so with that said, um, you know, there were some some questions that might lead to further discussion. If, if you're OK, can we get to this part now of you guys giving us specific things to do or or not do, as the case may be, uh, with Aaron's permission? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just, uh, you know, we there's there's several different things you've been seeing today we've we've got questions and suggestions on several of them there's the the action steps that are tested there are performance measures that we're using to filter and then there are sort of mixes of scenarios that try or there this the idea of having the scenario mix and calling out the common action steps in them was that those could perhaps be kernels of your draft alternatives so with that said uh are, are, there were a couple suggestions earlier but are there further suggestions are there things other things we should test. That's what that's a key question here. Do you need more analysis to help you in some specific way by testing some ingredient or some performance measurement that we we can feasibly do? So I want to hear about that because that might give us some guidance to, you know, dial this in even more for coming back to you in November. Okay, Jeff, uh, we actually have at least one question on this particular item. Bart, great. Maybe. Yeah. Bart, Excellent. Uh, one thing. That would be a need to test. I don't know if you can. Is what is an acceptable level of congestion that would change modes? Um, you know, we always strive for level of service. You know, A or B. But what would happen if we just said level of service C was acceptable uh -huh. system and we moved away from more capacity projects and focused more on multimodal transit projects? That's a great scenario to test i i have to say that in my judgment it would be um best to do that with a travel model and other tools gabby do you know of any way that ve would produce an answer on that front yeah i agree with your assessment there jeff we have so one of our first passes at this and and trying to select our metrics we 
We're not using the DVMT per capita. We were actually using uh, one of the congestion outputs that Vision Eval produces. And we just found that um, it just wasn't super sensitive, at least to this particular group of scenarios. Um, you know, maybe if we if we get more aggressive in the um, in the ITS investment, or maybe choose some more scenarios that that have a higher linkage to level of service, then then maybe that will change. But um, I agree that this is maybe not the best tool for for looking at congestion. And although it does account for congestion, like I said, we we took a stab at it, and and our first take here in the preliminary analysis was that it, it wasn't showing a lot of sensitivity. So um, thanks for that. Uh, different tool required. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a great planning question. Uh, a lot of people are talking about just that. Other other suggestions of what to do next. I, I, I found the ones in my notes here. I can bring those forward for just sort of affirmation by the group if uh, if you want. But I want to hear if you folks have anything else to say before I do that. If, oh, one, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I, Brad, uh, who's a traffic engineer, I um, am really, really curious about the land use question. I know you said that we kind of assumed a set land use, and if there was any way to look at how densities, because as Bart had mentioned, really that interplays so closely, and as you kind of alluded to, Anchorage does have kind of a not as sensitive to the modal, in part because of land use, and Kind of associated with that a little bit too is the question of traffic to and from the Matsu. Uh, I know that as I've looked at the model, it looks like future projections continue to increase the amount of traffic to and from the Matsu. And and with how things have been changing a little bit, I am curious about that. I don't know if this is the right tool for that, but I am curious what your thoughts are. You're muted, Jeff. We mentioned that the model can test land use scenarios. So again, Gabby's the expert, but it's conceivable that we could test a different pattern of, uh, I mean, for example, when you make the remark you made, uh, I envision uh, a scenario that says, okay, there's a lot more of uh, things like retail destinations in Matsu in 2050, and therefore more what we forecasters call internal trip making within that sub area of the region. And and that's conceivable to test, yes, Gabby. Again, that's that's a scenario that is the travel model in conjunction with a different land use scenario could also test. But could 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 VE bite that one off? Yeah, the there's I'm, the real question is, you know, we can definitely test land use, but there there's a lot of options. So it's how do we want to parse it, and and what scenarios do we want to test? You can test. Uh, increased housing density, you can um, test increased employment density. Um, there's a couple of those EPA smart location database inputs I was referring to that tie into land use. So uh, transit accessibility and frequency is an input. There's another one that is used to try to approximate walkability using intersection de density. So that's one that we could we could maybe um, try to look at in the, the Matsu area to see if that potentially reduced auto dependence in that particular area. Um, so there's a number of different inputs that we could bring to bear on the land use question. It's just deciding which ones. <laughs> So thanks. That's a that's a possibility. I I should have remarked that, uh, you know, uh, AMAT staff are going and and we're noting everything down that you're suggesting. There's going to be a step where the consultant team will have to work with the AMAT staff to kind of finalize what what we actually uh, can do. So this is listing suggestions, and then of course uh, we work for Aaron, so to speak. So he's gonna he and his team are gonna make the final call. But we certainly want to hear. Uh, just because of scope and practicality issues, but we certainly want to try to do what you want. So uh, 
that sounds like uh, we, that's one we could do. We could test a different land use scenario. The there there is some devil in the detail work that would have to be done, but it's it's certainly conceivable. Are there other uh, suggested different tests before we uh, before I repeat back to you or what I heard earlier? Uh, yeah, James. Yeah, uh, I I kind of wanted to get back to the idea of um, modeling the the level of maintenance uh, or, or 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 getting the effect of the level of maintenance uh, on on system performance. Uh, and I just kind of and I don't really have a great suggestion. I was talking. I was thinking maybe you know if. If you altered like the uh, assumed speed limit, uh, lower it to kind of be a proxy of lower maintenance. You know, lower maintenance makes it harder to 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 drive uh, to drive higher speeds or or something to that effect. But I think there needs I think there's a need shown to have a better. Uh, a better proxy for maintenance besides what we were talking about earlier, the level of funding, the revenues. Um, so I just I just really wanted to put a, a, a dot on that I uh, to, to, to suggest that that would be a useful uh, exercise. To, to we, the proxies. Could we dig into that just a little bit? I I understand where you're going. Um, so. If we think that through, you know, your suggestion is one of the tactical adjustments that we could make. I, I've done this with travel model scenarios as well, as I mentioned earlier. So we basically are representing a system supply that has been compromised in certain ways because of the inability to maintain it. So we're saying that speeds are lower, maybe capacities are lower, and other things that our expert Gabby may help us think about. So we designed a scenario where the system is basically not performing as well. Uh, just understand then that what you're going to see is in, in the in the strategic model, uh, you know, absent some full on benefit cost analysis, you're going to see degraded system performance come out. It is and so uh, because this model isn't doing the financial accounting, you're you're going to see just in general a degraded system performance. Is 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 that helpful to you? Um, in other words, what what outcomes? What what would? How is it, is that going to help you def, de, define the plan alternative that you have to define eventually in some way? I, I'm trying to get to the how it's going to help you downstream, and I'm I'm happy to happy to entertain the the we can run the scenario. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure, sure it's helpful. Sure, I think I think what I if, if there was. A meaningful outcome out of that is to see if we if we model it with a degraded system. If when we start pulling these other levers, uh, like increased transit or increased non-motorized uh, um, access, you know, will do those compensate for that degraded service? Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. So the the degra the degradation as a result of inability to maintain when you're trying to achieve other things, what happens then? Is that a fair reflection? Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, is now a good time, Aaron, for me to repeat back the other two suggestions we heard earlier? Yeah, we're we're running short on time. So let's go ahead and go through that real quick. Yeah, I mean, that's really what we're after here. The the next steps that I'll I'll repeat those back. Make sure that we understood them correctly, and then, as I said, I, I should spend the last minute or two on next steps so the group, the groups combined, now understand what happens in the future. So, what we heard earlier, and and everyone, correct me if there are more than two. If in case I missed something, I've been taking notes uh, and trying to answer in the chat simultaneously. So, we heard uh, that the it might be helpful to look at different alternative fuels for the transit fleet. So that's a, and and there are. Uh, we can supply a list of those fuels that the model is sensitive to, and and uh, the group could um, <clears throat> give further guidance. That's one additional suggestion. And then I also heard that there is uh, that sort of looking at the different uh, or or looking at it from the perspective of revenue is perhaps not helpful, uh, which is really less of a test than than a sort of a specification of what performance metrics you care about. 
So those were the two things I heard that spoke to further analysis or the the way about which we go about further analysis. So are those two things that the group would agree with that we should put a, a different transit alternative fuels test on the list of next steps and that we or you to be more accurate do not necessarily need to see the revenue outcomes? Yeah, I have a comment on that. So with regard to our transit fleet, our most likely scenario is to go with uh, a hybrid uh, conventional fuel vehicle. So we're not we're not really concerned with uh, different types of fuel as much as different types of technology, I think. Well, OK, I'm, 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 I'm speaking out of turn here. Um, <laughs> you missed my initial comment <laughs> when we first started talking about this. So we have to do a study that is going to determine what the best alternative fuel is going to be before we do any sort of investment with our federal funds. At this I see. So okay. I'm sorry. We can't cherry pick basically uh, an alternative. So them providing us with some variety may be helpful as to what we will um, look at and consider. But um, right now, what they were showing was just the EVs, and that is. That's definitely not where we're right. Headed. That's that's not yeah. where we're headed. But when, if you're going to model um, emissions, especially greenhouse gas emissions, you need to not only know what kind of fuel you're going to use, but what kind of combination, uh, what kind of vehicle, essentially, is it going to be all EV? Is it going to be a uh, a hybrid? Is it going to be a you know you you right. and that that is a very likely scenario. Hybrid. Um, so, okay, I, 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 I see you need to, you need to see what kind of, uh, fuel options you're going to consider before you make a decision about the fleet, but, um, again, the, if, if we're, if we're looking at an output of, um, Massive emissions of, of greenhouse gases uh, and, and other pollutants, other air pollutants, then you, you, you still want to make it specific to the kind of vehicle and you're going to end up with. I guess I see, see, I see two parts here. One is what we're saying and presenting. I think in this case, saying EVs for the transit fleet is a little bit problematic. Yes. Um, the second is what's the outcome from the analysis, which, you know, it could be a placeholder, you know, I see two things there. I think the same thing with the maintenance versus the revenue. The question of we're presenting additional revenue as a maintenance, which I feel like we've identified as a problem. It doesn't mean we need more analysis of maintenance or we need more analysis of, of that. I don't think so, but I think it's problematic to present it as that. And I think maybe the same way it's problematic to present transit fleet as being EV, um, not necessarily speaking to the outcome of the of this vision eval analysis. And I think is from a from an outcome perspective, um, if you, you know if there's not a if there's not a significant difference in the outcome, whether it be EV versus CNG versus biomass, uh, and I don't think it's really that important to run numerous scenarios sure. using different fuel mixtures. Right. Um, maybe it's just uh, maybe it's just worth a footnote saying, you know, EV is a placeholder for yeah. these an alternative fuel. Measure. Some of this is managing expectations too. Yeah, I, I, wonder, I, 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 I think it makes sense to uh, simplify the uh, the fuel types down to um, what uh, gasoline, diesel, diesel EV, CNG, or CNG, and EV. Hydrogen. Say hydrogen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if the outcome if the outcome doesn't really make a huge difference between one or the other, it is exactly what Jamie's saying. It's a perception, not a yeah. outcome issue. How we're presenting it's it. how we present just it. like the question about the maintenance and the revenue. I mean, I think the, I'm not saying you need to do more analysis. I'm just saying let's not say that 
this is improving maintenance. So I think like how it's yeah, going to the public. Right. Yeah. You would maximize that by spec by buying the most fuel. Uh, you know. Yeah. Increasing traffic that's clear. Thank you. Possible. And that's that's not what we're aiming for. So I think this gives us enough to go on again, huddling with the AMAT staff to to proceed. Uh, thanks for the feedback on transit. I did want to see if there was consensus around the suggestion that we drop the performance metric of the tax revenue. Uh, and, and I want to be clear that that actually uh, might be helpful because as you saw, the tool has limited real estate. There are many measures that we talked about that you're not seeing because of the way the tool works in its filtering mode. So if we drop that, you could substitute something else in, well, but I then don't, I don't I don't want to drop it if, if if others find it useful. So is there a consensus of the group on that particular well, score? The last, the last recommended substitution was to instead model degradation of the road system and how that's going to affect um, what, using whatever inputs are, are sensible, whether it's reduced vehicle speed, I, I think that's what we replace it with is is an analysis of how is maintenance going to um, let's see. How, yeah, I, I would say another option is we just change the column of that table and we don't say that these additional income have to do with maintenance. We just say they yeah. are additional income. And there you go. It's not a modeling analysis change. It's just how we're presenting it. Additional income. Yeah, we got to be careful with that because that well, leads to our fiscal analysis that we're going to have to do later because we have to be able to identify all of our revenue sources. And I don't want to say there's this mysterious income out there that could be coming in, and then we don't reflect that in the fiscal analysis, and there's some issues there. So um, I think this may need some more discussion by staff and the consultants to kind of talk about what we want to do here. Because uh, we are out of time, so I want to respect the fact that everyone's very busy. So, sure. I think part of the problem is we we fed you some ill-conceived goals based on how we select projects, not necessarily how the transportation system as a whole functions. Uh, and I guess well, one last I've got is the land use one. Are, are you able to? Do you need more discussion on that? More question? Is well, I have, have concern about the land use one okay. um, because the municipality of Anchorage makes a determination for land use and they've already set their 2040 land use plan and I haven't been getting any indication that they're going to be making changes to that plan. So we would need to talk with them first because they've already set what kind of infill they want, where they want to focus on everything like that. And while we can come up with recommendations, if they're not interested in that from us, I don't really want to spend the time yeah. on it. And so we need to, really need to know if we, they need to make changes to accommodate what we're proposing. They need to know what that could be. Just like we're not planning to increase transit by 50%, but if that is something that is an output that should be looked at. But like just because something's already said, I don't think we should preclude it from being looked at. And it should be suggested as a change. And I would argue that this is one of the biggest problems if we do our siloing transportation and, and traf or land use and transportation, then you know we're gonna never re reach the, the vision that the community has. That's fine. I understand that. You guys didn't let me finish. My thing is I need to reach out to long range planning first and talk with them if they're okay with us doing this before we just make it happen. Yeah, sounds good. And explain to them just what Bart said. Because I don't want them caught off guard and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't ask for that. So it's working together to say, hey, we're going to be making some of these recommendations that mm -hmm. could include some land use change recommendations. Are you okay with that? And if so, then we can move together. Yeah, and even they, I'm sure they'll have ideas of things that they would yeah. want us to look at. So that's a great suggestion. So uh, I wanted to talk about next steps. Uh, remember, if you do have further comments or questions that we could answer, please email them to Aaron. He will get them to the consultant team. We, as, as mentioned, then we'll have to huddle and process what we've heard today and any fur uh, further comments you make by email with Aaron and other staff and uh, devise the specific plan of action. Uh, it seems like there's possible more analysis we could do, so we'll... Um, Again, process that, and then Aaron, of course, is your contact point. We are scheduled to be back with the TAC on the 3rd of November with uh, final findings to inform the 
the next step of alternatives or draft alternatives development. Uh, there's other material that will be coming to you, I know, and then we'll be before the policy committee at the uh, 17th of November. And uh, with that said, I think we're done. I just wanted to thank you all. It was a very lively discussion, which makes our job better because you're you're actually giving us information <laughs> and you're clearly engaged. So it was fun talking to you today, and I hope this was helpful. Thanks, Gabby. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. I know it was a long one. Um, the next work session will have to be even longer, so get ready for that one. <laughs> it was helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was super helpful. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Can I post something?